Good evening and uh, welcome to this week's edition of Behind Headlines where we will be marking the 80th anniversary of the famous Dan Busters raid uh, that took place on the 16th of May 1943 uh, and it was believed that uh, by taking out three major German dams in the industrial heartland of Nazi Germany that this would turn the war in the Allies favour. We also in this programme will be marking the bravery and the courage shown by the Lancaster pilots and aircrew who risked their lives for our freedom today. And in this programme, I'm joined by Alistair Scott. So it's great uh, you can join us on Behind the Headlines tonight, Alistair. Well, it's always good to be here, and uh, particularly for those Dan Busters, because as a, as a young, well, pre-teenager, it was a story that I would... Uh, caught my heart and I, you know I've seen the film several times over the years so so it's great to be part of this program today. Nice, absolutely. I'm just going to show you a picture of uh, that I actually got uh, last year at a, at a Battle of Britain air show uh, last year in Kent and there we see the uh, famous uh, Lancaster bombers uh, flying over and actually bombing the uh, German dams and if you can see very faintly you'll see lots of uh, signatures and uh, these were the RAF airmen who were actually involved in that famous and legendary uh, bombing of the uh, German dams known as the Dam Busters. So uh, we'll start off this one. So this is the 80th anniversary of the Dam Busters raid, probably the most uh, audacious raid uh, during the whole of the Second World War um, and the sheer bravery and courage and also the technical skill needed to carry out such an operation was incredible. So, But one of the big questions is always asked uh, with Bomber Command when it comes to the bombing of Dresden and the policy by Bomber Harris to bomb Dresden and some of the big industrial uh, cities in Germany to uh, to to really uh, drive Germany to its knees so that they would, uh, so they couldn't continue the fight against us was, was it morally correct um, to actually target these three major dams in Germany, knowing that the loss of life would run into the thousands? Yeah, I mean, it's such a difficult question uh, to answer in today's terms. But you've got to remember, that, as you just mentioned, that technology was was so much uh, behind where we are at the moment for for precise precision bombings and and so on. And and you have to also think of the heart of the people. It wasn't in order to destroy lives. They were looking to bring the war to an end quickly uh, and they felt this was the only way and and I mean when you think of the the bouncing bomb as they called it it was an amazing invention because there was nothing like it was ever even known you know you, you of, of course you'd have submarines with with the missiles and so on torpedo attacks going on but this was a, a bomb that was uh, going to be dropped from the skies and was going to bounce and take out an industrial area which was actually used for production production of weaponry and uh, uh, planes and and, and even bombs uh, uh, the, the ship's uh, uh, backup system. So it would, would must have been the most difficult decision anyone had to make. But you know, I always think, you know, as God says, I, He looks at the heart. The heart was to bring everything to a close and to save life long term. And That's sure, there was a major cost of life I, I, at the time. And I think it's morally easy, 80 years mm, on, to yes. look back uh, on the 16th and the 17th of May, 1943, and said that it was actually wrong to actually target these dams, primarily because we were in a total war. It was a war of survival um, that uh, uh, the Americans had just really started to uh, share the kind of bombing raids o over over Germany to try and bomb Germany into submission. We, we know that they've been bombing London and Manchester and Birmingham, other major British cities, including Glasgow as well, uh, from after the uh, Battle of Britain in September of 1940, causing absolute carnage and, and mayhem. And also the fact that this was a total war, that if we lost this war, uh, we would have been taken over by Nazi yeah. Germany. Who would have known what would have happened to our Jewish community had probably rounded up and sent to the gas chambers. Uh, we would have lost our democracy, we would have lost our freedom um, and our liberty, and we would be under a totalitarian Nazi regime. Uh, and so therefore any effort um, to actually bring the war to an end uh, is in my opinion kind of morally justified because it was a war of survival. 
this wasn't a, a war of choosing. We had no other choice but to fight this one. So just a reminder of uh, this historic occasion. So on the night of the 16th of May, going into the 17th of May, 1943, Lancaster bombers belonging to RAF Squadron 617 Bomber Command carried out uh, the audacious raid to take out three dams in the Ruhr Valley uh, in the industrial heartland of the Nazi war machine, uh, the most highly defended area within Germany. The idea was to take out the Nazi war machine either by submission or destruction, and the Lancaster bomber was critical to this objective by Bomber Command. Uh, these dams were highly protected by anti-aircraft guns and torpedo nets uh, to stop underwater attacks. The British had developed a secret weapon designed by Barnes Wallace, the bouncing bomb. We also, we also be discussing the huge moral dilemma of the bombing the dams that would have killed thousands of ordinary people. And we'll reflect on the ingenuity of developing the bouncing bomb to the sheer bravery and skill of the pilots um, of the Lancaster bombers who carried out the Dam Busters raid. Um, do you want to share with us a little bit, um, Alistair, about the operation? Because this was called Operation Chastise. Yeah, I mean, it was an amazing time. And as, I just, as you were just talking about, you know, this was 1943. The war had already been going on for three years and they were, uh, the, the war machine was really going through Europe. We were kind of slightly away from it, but we were being bombed in this nation too. But yeah, Operation Chastise. The mission to bomb the German dams was top secret, so the squadron was originally called Squadron Nix uh, before it was uh, renamed 617 Squadron. And I think we all remember that name and number. The squadron was established from the elite pilots and air crew of RAF Bomber Command to carry out an audacious operation deep into the industrial heartland of the Third Reich. The dam buses were, were members of the RAF uh, 617 squadron who were specially assembled uh, in March 1943 to bomb three dams in Germany's industrial heartland, the Ruhr Valley, just two months later. They didn't have a long time of um, uh, training and preparing. The raid on the night of May 16th and 17th was called Operation Chastise and involved 133 aircrew flying 19 specially adapted Lancaster bombers. The operation occurred on the night of the 16th, 1940, May 1943, when 19 modified Lancaster bombers had to fly over Nazi-occupied Europe, flying under radar and using only a map and compass, flying at the height of the treetops, a very low-flying aircraft there, until they reached their target, the mighty Mon Dam of 2,000-foot-long uh, wall of granite. So it was uh, pretty secure. There was another two German dams that uh, would be targeted that night. The, the three huge dams that were attacked held back 100 billion gallons of water, critical to the production of the hydroelectric power uh, that turned the cogs of the Nazi war machine, a regime that had already eth uh, ethnically cleansed so much of continental Europe that did not meet the Nazi criteria of the pure race according to their ideology, and thus the inferior races were not deemed worthy to live. It's un unbelievable. The Lancaster bombers were, were each armed with a newly designed bouncing bomb that would attack the dams at 200 miles per hour and only 60 foot above the, the, the water, which was suicidal, and the Lancaster was not designed for such missions. This was the greatest feat of low-level flying during the Second World War. Well, it's absolutely remarkable. Amazing. I mean, the ingenuity um, to actually come up and develop the bouncing bomb in the first place uh, w was incredible enough. But, but the actual, to carry out the operation itself, um, that was just absolutely phenomenal. The bravery and, of those uh, people. And the bravery and the courage mm. was, was, was immense. So according to the um, RAF Dam Busters 80, uh, if you go on to the RAF uh, website, and they've got a whole uh, a few pages dedicated to the 80th anniversary of the Dam Busters. I said that uh, uh, Barnes Wallace, mm. a Vickers Armstrong assistant chief designer, came up with the idea for a unique new weapon, popularly called the Bouncing Bomb, uh, but was known by its codename as Upkeep. It was a 9,000 pound cylinder mine that was designed to bounce across the surface of the water until it hit a dam. It would then sink 
and the hydrostatic fuse would detonate the mine at a depth of 30 feet. Uh, Wallace's big discovery was to create shock waves that, mo that were damaged and caused not by the blast, but by the pressure or the shock wave that would explode beneath the surface of the water. The structure of the dam meant that the, the uh, detonation must be initiated at the greatest possible depth in the medium of the water or earth in contact with the target. Uh, Wallace first conceived the idea of the Rochiching weapon to increase range early in 1942 in his garden in Surrey, overlooking Effingham Golf Course, uh, using marbles provided by his daughter Elizabeth, um, supplemented by a half inch spear of wood and fiber. To operate effectively, upkeep had to have a backspin imparted on it before it left the plane. Uh, this required specialist apparatus that was designed by Roy Chadwick and his team at uh, Avro, the company that also manufactured the Lancaster bombers in the Northwest. Uh, we see there the beginning of the opposition came from, uh, from the Dambusters mm. raid, came from Bonner Command himself, Arthur Harris, also known as Bomber Harris, who thought it was a crazy scheme that would divert too much resources from the war effort. And uh, he describes it as this, that uh, this type of wildest, uh, he says that Wallace's efforts was tripe of the wildest description. Uh, there are so many ifs and buts, and there isn't the smallest chance of it working. So despite the opposition, uh, Barnes Wallace stuck to his guns and eventually won over the Air Chief Marshal, Sir Charles Portal, and uh, the Chief of, of Air Staff to instruct Bomber Command to proceed with the operation. Mm. I mean, what's, what's extraordinary is that, you know, you had someone like... Um, uh, Bonds Wallace, who was a was a scientist, he was an engineer. Mm. He thought outside the box. He was also, uh, from what I read from my accounts as well, um, a very a devoted man of God. He was yes. a Christian. He was uh, influenced by godly principles, and was determined that this was going to succeed. So he uh, he pressured the RAF High Command. He pressured the leadership of of the RAF to say, look, give, give this opportunity a chance, because before it was using what limited number of uh, Lancaster bombers we had to carry out bombing raids into the heart of Germany. Mm. Um, and if you consider then that they, they do damage, they wouldn't do as much damage as these bouncing bombs would do to uh, Germany's industrial base, which, mm. which is so needed for, the, uh, for their war efforts. Yeah, I mean, you can, as you were just talking, as a believer, it must have been such a, uh, he must have been hearing from God as, as just something that was so important. Should, we, should, should I just read a little bit more about the Dan Buster's uh, 617 Squadron? The legendary 617 yeah, the le Squadron. We all remember the name when you see the film and, uh, and the, the music that goes with it. I'll never forget that. Uh, so yeah, let me give you some facts. RAF 617 Squadron was formed at Scampton in Lincolnshire with Wing Commander Guy Gibson, who's famous as its commander. Many of the air crews selected for this particular mission were personally chosen by Gibson himself. Gibson only had three weeks to assemble his air crews, ground staff and auxiliary work support needed to accomplish the Dan Buster's mission. And then eight weeks of intensive low level training and technical preparation before the raid. Security, as you can imagine, was extremely tight and the air crew was, were instructed to tell nobody about, about uh, they, what they were doing due to classified nature, the classified nature of the whole operation. And uh, Gibson was the only person that actually knew the full operation. No one, else, no one else did. They no. knew that they were involved in the secret operation, but didn't have the details in, in touch to the day of the operation, which was the 16th and 17th of May, 1943. Yeah. Um, the, uh, also, we known that there were three major targets selected. They were the Moha, the Ida, and the Sorp Dam. The timing of the raid was contingent on several factors, uh, including weather, the lunar cycle, and the ability to supply the modified planes and equipment. May the 16th and 17th was only selected a few days prior to the actual raid. Uh, May was chosen because it was when the dams were at their fullest from the melting of the snow in the mountains and would therefore have the greatest impact on bursting of the dams. According to the RAF, the, the Mole Dam was a curved gravity dam and was 40 metres high and 650 metres long. 
There was uh, tree covered hills around the reservoir, but any attacking aircraft would be exposed to the immediate approach of the dam. The Ida Dam was a similar construction, uh, but was even more challenging target uh, as it was the winding reservoir bordered by steep hills and the only approach of the Lancaster bombers could be from the north. And the Scorp Dam was a different construction and had the watertight concrete core of 10 metres wide at the end of the reservoir. And the land rose steeply and there was a church spire in the path of the attacking mm -hmm. aircraft. So let's ha have a look now at um, a reenactment mm -hmm. essentially of the famous Dam Busters raid that occurred uh, on the night of the 16th and 17th of May 1943. And this marked the uh, 70th anniversary 10 years ago. And uh, this week's special guest on Behind the Headlines is Reverend Richard Downs, who was a former chaplain to the British Armed Forces in Germany. Uh, Richard, it's an absolute pleasure that you can join us on Behind the Headlines, um, particularly coming from Germany. Um, can you share with us the role that you've played in being a, a chaplain to our armed forces, particularly those who are serving out in Germany? Yeah, certainly. Um, well, hello, everyone. And it's a great pleasure to be on, on this show. Uh, I'm a retired army chaplain. I served um, in the army as a chaplain for 25 years, although my faith came alive as a soldier uh, sometime before that. So uh, I was a soldier for 10 years, uh, then trained for the ministry, um, six years as a civilian and then back into the army. And uh, so my total army service is 35 years. So it's been my, my life, really. And, uh, and uh, I love soldiers. Um, my duties have taken me to a variety of places, both in wartime and peace. So I've served in both Afghanistan, uh, Iraq, uh, Kosovo, three tours of Northern Ireland. Um, so I've seen the rough and the smooth of, uh, of army life and supported families uh, through those challenges. Um, but it's also been a great delight to be um, involved in evangelism and uh, helping soldiers find that faith and it's actually a particular delight is that three um, service personnel 
uh, or the families uh, are now ordained ministers, which is really exciting. So, uh, yeah, I've had quite a, a long and varied career. Amazing. Great, great to hear your, your story there, Richard. Uh, as you know, we're marking the 80th anniversary of one of the most audacious and well-known, probably, air raids of the Second World War, the famous Dam Busters. And most of us of a certain age have seen the film. Uh, the, the operation to take out three major dams in the industrial heartland of Nazi Germany. What are your thoughts, Richard, on, on the Dam Busters raid and why it has captured the heart and uh, the imagination of the British public for 80 years? It was an extraordinary, brave and audacious um, piece of uh, military heroism, I would say. Uh, and, uh, the, and the theme of the Dam Busters um, is so well known. In fact, actually, it's been used as one of our church hymns. It's so, so well known. Um, and the story of the Dam Busters as well. I think uh, everyone has heard of the bouncing bomb, probably thinks of something looking like a football. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it was a lot more complicated than that. And, and I think the, the story of Guy Gibson as such a, a young commander and the daring do, which is so well captured uh, in that, um, that movie from the 1950s, still um, lives long in, in the hearts of people. Everyone knows about the Dam Busters, but probably doesn't know actually exactly what happened. And um, R Richard, um, share with us how back in uh, 2013, a decade ago, you personally became involved with the last survivor of the Dam Busters raid, uh, Johnny Johnson, and how you actually invited him to, uh, to Germany. Sh share us the story. Yeah, it's an extraordinary story, actually. It, and it goes back to, to the fact that I'm really rubbish at receiving presents. Uh, normally, when my family give me presents, I, I put them to one side, say thank you very much at the time. But uh, one Christmas, um, so Christmas of 2012, um, my wife gave me a whole set of paperbacks uh, about the Second World War. And uh, I actually read them. <laughs> and the one that really captured my imagination was The Dam Busters Raid by John Sweetman. Um, now, at that time, uh, we were planning a what was called a, a soldier and community course, so a moral education course for soldiers in Germany. And uh, we had uh, our retreating conference centre uh, was the place that we were going to hold this course, a um, place called um, Church House in Lübecker Minden. Uh, and when we approached the conference centre to look for dates, they said, well, the only available date is the 16th, 17th of May. Uh, <laughs> and lo and behold, we discovered that that was the anniversary of the, uh, the Dan Busters raid. And then just before that, I received a phone call out of the blue uh, from, I can't remember his name now, but a member of um, Alpha to the Forces, a former RAF um, um, airman uh, who was having dinner with Johnny Johnson, the last surviving dam buster. And he said, um, would there be any chance of, uh, of making a link with what we were doing with our moral education of soldiers? And, and so we, he, on our behalf, invited Johnny to come out to Germany. Uh, Johnny couldn't, but in the end, he gave a bespoke interview, um, video interview of his experiences. And he was the last surviving dam buster. And so I just felt the Lord was behind this, putting this book in my hand, giving us a date for a course um, that uh, coincided with the dam buster raid, and then putting us in touch with the last surviving dam buster. And so I think he perhaps um, uh, had, had some plans. And uh, actually on that course, uh, 13 soldiers who came on it expressed an interest in the Christian faith. And so really it was a real blessing. That's amazing. It's a really, really interesting story there. Um, Richard, I'm, I'm sure our viewers would love you to share uh, also um, the strategic reason why the RAF decided to bomb these three major German dams, knowing that the, uh, the total destruction it was going to cause uh, if they were able to pull off this major operation. I suppose it's quite controversial, but uh, very necessary. Yeah, no, it, it is indeed. And um, I, I later became the warden of Church House Germany and developed um, uh, the capability of taking soldiers to these battlefield sites and telling the story and, and helping them uh, recapture some of the 
uh, moral challenges that uh, servicemen go through today because of uh, military service. Um, going back to, to 1943, the Dam Busters Raid, or Operation Chastise, as it was called, uh, was the closest thing to precision bombing. And it was really hoped that by attacking those dams, um, that it would bring the war to an early conclusion. But the um, preparation or the desire to attack German war industry, um, especially the dams, goes all the way back to 1937, even before the World War began. So contingencies were being put in place to how to uh, prevent or at least to shorten the war. Um, and uh, interestingly, um, the Germans were aware of the vulnerability of dams even before the war. Uh, the director of the, the Dams Association in the Ruhr Valley warned the German armed forces uh, of the destructive capability of water um, and, uh, and also the fact that whatever charge was laid against the, jam the dam had to be put subsurface. And all of this featured into the research of um, Barnes Wallace as he developed the, um, uh, the rotating, what later be called um, the bouncing bomb, but its code name was Upkeep. Uh, so yeah, it was a, a desire to bring the war to an early conclusion. It was the closest thing that the RAF had at the time to precision bombing, um, cause uh, in the plans to attack the German uh, war industry, uh, only uh, one in 10 Allied bombers were getting within five miles of their targets in the Ruhr. Mm. And it was thought that by releasing this massive inundation of water, it would not only disrupt the, um, the, the war industry, but destroy uh, the factories that um, uh, were um, actively engaged in uh, um, providing um, arms and ammunition and tanks, U-boats. Kind of uh, and, and Richard, can you just share with us the uh, sheer logistical challenges uh, faced by the, uh, the RAF and the um, pilots uh, flying those uh, Lancaster bombers to take out these three major dams, um, low level flying, flying under the radar, but also then facing the prospect of uh, facing German artillery guns and having to actually attack these dams in the most fortified area of, of Germany. Show what it would have been like being a pilot in flying one of those Lancaster bombers to drop this famous bouncing bomb on one of these dams. No, absolutely. It is an extraordinary uh, feat of, um, of pilot skill. Uh, not only did they have to bring um, this secret weapon, shall we say, from RAF Scampton uh, in East Anglia, all the way across the, the channel and then across the Dutch coastline uh, at uh, three different crossing points to evade, they had to fly low enough to evade uh, the radar. Uh, the Germans had a very sophisticated radar system. They also had night fighter squadrons as well. Uh, and so in fact, um, although quite a lot of aircraft were lost uh, on the uh, approach, um, to deliver these uh, these devices. Most of the losses, I think, were happened, uh, certainly with the significant losses happened on the way back, because of course, uh, it was a surprise um, night flying, uh, but then the enemy, as it were, were woken up big time uh, as uh, the, um, the raiders um, made their escape, as it were. Uh, so it was hazardous both going in and going out. Uh, some of the aircraft were lost uh, because of low flying, uh, one of the aircraft discharged its um, upkeep uh, bouncing bomb uh, just off the Dutch coast because it was flying too low. Another aircraft hit low power lines just to show how how uh, low they were flying. Also, um, whereas now modern aircraft will have uh, glo global positioning uh, satellite devices, GPS, uh, it was by map and compass and in the dark flying very low and very fast. It was an extraordinary um, thing. Uh, and for the Mona Dam, particularly, uh, as the, the raiders arrived, uh, they faced 12 anti-aircraft cannons. The the Edize was defended by one sentry with a rifle. <laughs> but the, the Mona Zay was something different. And it actually, it was at the Mona Zay uh, that um, uh, Guy Gibson won his VC because he personally flew his aircraft in uh, to, as a decoy 
directly into enemy fire to um, to try and distract from the aircrafts coming behind him. It was extraordinary. Mm. Bravery. Amazing, such a uh, amazing story, isn't it? And I mean, we we tend to affect. Uh, uh, you know, the technology at the time was so much more uh, less sophisticated than we have today. But Richard, maybe you can share with us again and the viewers something of the, the, the total damage that was caused by these bouncing bombs that breached those dams. Yeah. Um, there were an awful lot more than three dams on uh, Bomber Command's uh, target list. Uh, they were known as, as, as the last resort dams. Uh, the three major ones, though, uh, uh, X, Y, and Z, um, was the Mona Dam, the Eda Dam, and the Sorpa Dam. Um, the Eda Dam and the Mona Dam were what are called gravity dams, uh, which is a dam which holds uh, um, by its sheer weight. It's sort of triangular in shape, if you like, in cross-section, and holds the weight um, of, of the dam to the valley floor and makes the seal that way. Whereas the Sorpa Dam was an earth dam, which was, if you like, a brick wall with banks either side of it and a much harder target, if you like, to, to damage. And in fact, mm. um, the Sorpa Dam only received a crack on its crest and didn't breach, whereas the uh, Eda and the um, Mona were breached. Uh, as a result of the upkeep devices, um, certainly the Mona Dam released a 10 meter high uh, wave of, of water, uh, which then rushed down uh, the, the valley. Very sadly, uh, the first casualties of the Mona Dam breach were slave labor um, concentration camp victims who were there working on, on the dam, the, the uh, power, the um, hydroelectric um, capabilities of the dam. They were intended or temporary accommodation below the dam, and they were the first to be killed. Um, but a huge amount of uh, destruction um, ensued with this uh, wall of water. Uh, the Ada Dam released a 12-meter uh, a high um, wave, and um, the flow as a result of the Ada Dam breach uh, carried on for at least 48 hours. Uh, the River Rhine. Uh, rose four meters above its normal height. And interestingly, even though some people criticized the dam buster saying that it was a waste of time or it was a sort of uh, a white elephant, as it were, um, a lot uh, of the um, factories, munition factories, U-boat um, parts factories that were destroyed in the raid were on Bomber Command's target list anyway. Yeah. Uh, and Richard, finally, uh, looking back at the uh, historic and uh, audacious uh, Dam Busters raid 80 years ago, um, can you share with us, was it morally right to have actually bombed the dams knowing the thousands of lives uh, that uh, bombing these dams would actually cause on innocent civilians caught up in the war? Yeah. <laughs> It is a very difficult moral question, particularly uh, today um, with the laws of international armed conflict uh, to attack um, dams of that nature is illegal now um, because it's recognized that these are essential to the infrastructure of, of a civil community. And now um, uh, our armed forces have precision weapons um, that would deal with the the arms industry without the necessity of that. But, but at the time, um, there was no alternative. Um, the, as I said, the bomber crews were getting within uh, only um, five miles of their target and the huge amount of loss of bomber crews. Also, you have to rem um, remember that it was total war um, where the whole country is mobilized together with its industry for the war effort. And to a certain extent, when it is total war, gloves are off. Um, there's no such thing as a clean, tidy war. We try to um, encourage our soldiers uh, towards the laws of armed conflict and also just war, uh, just in bello, so justice in war. Um, but it, it was regarded as the closest thing to strategic to, so to to targeted 
uh, strategic bombing. Uh, Richard, we just want to thank you so much uh, for joining us from Germany today. Uh, and you're really quite an expert on the dam busters. So we really appreciate your insight, your expertise. And thank you so much for joining us. And for our viewers, we really do need to keep in prayer our armed forces that are putting their lives on the line for our freedom and for our security. Great interview with uh, Richard. And yes, as, as uh, we've just heard from Simon, it's such an important thing for us to be constantly, as believers, praying for our nation uh, and praying for those brave people uh, and giving thanks to God for those brave people who, who yeah, risked their lives and gave their lives. A lot of them, you know, we don't, the numbers as we heard just now, the numbers that didn't make it back, the casualties and deaths and so on. But it's so important for us to I mean, most of us have seen the film and seen the, see, seen the, seen the clips that we've just been watching will remember the, 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 the aircraft. They're, they're well known. Any, any fly pass that we've been on recently, you'd have seen uh, the Lancaster bombers as part of them. So I'm just going to read a little bit more about the Lancaster bomber. The Avro Lancaster is, is the most famous and successful RAF heavy bombers of the Second World War. And, uh, and, and today, there are only two airworthy, yeah. airworthy Lancasters in the world of the 7,377 that were built. That's amazing. So only two flying, only two which left. is incredible. Yeah. And um, a couple of years ago, where I, where I live, um, I was taking my dog out and, and suddenly this Lancaster bomber flew over yeah. uh, it was, and it was just breathtaking. The, the, and that's what I loved about uh, that, that video that we show us of the Lancaster bomber. Yeah. Those, Rolls-Royce Merlin engines are kind of roaring. It's, it's got this roaring it's sound. It's sound, it? isn't yeah. it? It's a distinctive sound as well as it's a fabulous, distinctive look. I mean, if you think about any war plane during the Second World War, that one and the Spitfire come to mind. They're, 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 they're the two one, um, things that made such a difference to the result of the war. No, absolutely. So uh, the, the, uh, the Spitfire gets a lot of credit and, and gets the glory, but also I think a lot of glory goes to the actual design yeah. of the Lancaster itself right. yeah. uh, and the, the fact that sadly there's only two left. So if you do see uh, a Lancaster a bomber flying in the sky, then uh, you're one of the privileged few. And I know that to, to mark the 80th anniversary, the Lancaster bomber is flying over Lincoln. So if you're in the Lincoln area, um, then watch out, look at the skies, and uh, you might be privileged enough mm. to see one of those Lancaster bombers fly by. Yeah, yeah. So should I read some more? Since Please, yeah. 1942, the Avro Lancaster bomber was the main heavy bomber deployed by the RAF Bomber Command to take the war, uh, uh, the heartland of Nazi Germany. It resulted from a design work undertaken by Roy Chadwick and his Avro team to overcome the problems experienced with the twin-engined Manchester bomber. The prototype made its first flight in January 1941, an impressive performance and, ex and an excellent flying characteristic. It's, it soon established its superiority over the other allied four-engined bombers operating in Europe. The industrial and military organization needed to build and operate the Lancaster was huge. Six major companies built 7,377 aircraft uh, at 10 different factories on two continents. At the height of production, over 1,100,000 men and women were employed uh, working for over 920 companies. More service personnel were involved in flying and maintaining it than any other British aircraft in history. The Lancaster's operational career is littered with impressive statistics. Some are set out below, but it's worth remembering that the average age of the seven-man crew was only 22 years. The air crew endured danger and discomfort, and many showed great courage. I would say all showed great courage in continuing to fly, knowing the odds against survival were high. Bomber Command suffered the highest casualty rate of any branch of the British services in World War II. On average, Lancaster's completed 21 missions before being lost. The Lancaster first flew in January 1941 and entered production in early 1942. It entered combat in April of that same year. A mid-wing design with a twin tail, uh, the Lancaster was powered by four 1,460 horsepower Rolls-Royce Merlin engines, had a wingspan of 31 meters and was 21 meters long. 
It was operated by a basic crew of seven, including the pilot, the co-pilot, bombardier, navigator, radio man and gunners. It could reach a maximum speed of 280 miles per hour and a ceiling of 7,500 meters and it could carry 16,350 kilogram bomb load to, uh, to, to a range of 1,660 miles at 200 miles per hour. Almost all of the 7,377 7, 7, Lancasters produced during the war were committed to the nighttime strategic bombing of German cities. For these missions, the plane's spacious bomb bays uh, typically carried a mixed load of high explosive bombs. The Lancaster bombers played a major role in the preparations for D-Day, June 6, 1944, conducting accurate attacks on bridges, rail yards and other transportation targets. I mean, they were quite incredible yeah. because what they're finding out is that the uh, the previous, we had the Halifax uh, yeah. was one of the bombers, uh, the Manchester bomber as well, only had two engines. And, and so therefore they couldn't really take the fight to Germany. Yeah. Uh, and this is why they developed the Lancaster bomber with those four Merlin engines. So it was strong enough, had the capabilities to actually fly to Germany uh, and, and yeah. back again. Of course, also in 1943, we saw the magnificent American American uh, B-17 flying fortresses as well, carrying out operations into Germany. But the problem they had, and the same with the Lancaster bomber, is that there weren't fighters to protect them. So as soon as either they go into German territory and the closer they get to their targets, they're met with heavy artillery fire. Mm. And then they're met by uh, German squadrons of Messerschmitts and, and fighter pilots, which uh, with those planes, they're easy to shoot down. So this is when the Americans then started to develop uh, <coughs> flying of the Mustang fighters, the P-51s, together with, um, with those flying fortresses when they carried out bombing raids to actually protect the bombers, because that's what the bombers were demanding, because when they went in, they had no protection. That's why uh, the casualties were so high if you're part of uh, RAF Bomber Command. And the most loneliest place to be on the entire plane would have been at the back with the rear gunner, yes. um, because usually then you're cut off from the rest of the crew. So you're in a very, very dangerous situation being right at the back of the aircraft. Uh, this takes us on uh, to that uh, famous night mm. on uh, the 16th to the 17th of May of 1943. So crews belonging to 167 Squadron had to deal without modern computerized equipment and had to calculate using maps, compasses, pencils, rulers and uh, flying in the dark sortie was akin to taking a seven hour maths exam in the dark whilst being shot at, and this is according to Channel 4's programme, the uh, Dam Busters. These difficulties were intrinsic to all bombing missions, though for the pilots of the operation of Chastise, the Dam Busters raid had the additional challenge of having to be flown over a mere 100 feet off the ground to avoid radar or 60 metres. Um, it was on 9.28pm uh, on the 16th of May, 133 RAF aircrew in 19 Lancaster bombers took off in three waves to bomb the dams. Gibson was flying the first wave and his aircraft was first to attack the Mohan at 12.28am. Uh, Five aircraft had to drop their bombs before it was breached. The remaining aircraft had to stop and drop their bombs, then attacked Ida, and then finally collapsed at 1.52 a.m. Meanwhile, aircraft from the other two uh, waves bombed the SORP, but it remained intact. Um, I mean, it's incredible. I mean, to actually fly those, Alistair, those Lancaster bombs at 60 metres, just above treetop level to avoid radar, knowing that you've got these sophisticated weapons. You don't know what opposition you're gonna meet when you actually get there. So they had to fly into the most heavily defended part of Germany, which was its industrial heartland in, in the Rye Valley, to take out these dump dams to actually destroy mm. the Germans' uh, ability to for its heavy industry to carry on the Nazi war effort. Uh, and it was believed that if they could carry out this attack, then this would bring the war to a swifter end. Mm. I mean, the bravery of it, and something you just touched on what you were reading and saying there, um, once they had even delivered the bombs, they had to get back 
and, and I mean they were at the limit of their range in some ways and uh, being such large targets they were slower than, than the, the, the flights that the, uh, the Germans would, would send up to take them out. So they were having again to escape in a, from, from those who were determined to knock them down. There were anti-aircraft guns going all over the place. It's just, a, it's just an incredible story really to, to even begin to think about. But, um, but I mean it's something Richard just talked about earlier in the interview uh, about, about the damage that was done to, to the German dam. So uh, let, let's just reiterate some of the things that he, he kind of mentioned there. And, and this is Richard's own research, so we, are, yeah. we, we thank Richard for his own uh, research that he's yeah, he, done he thoroughly into the amazing guy, right. Amazing guy to listen to and to talk to and uh, the research. He, he really is an expert. Uh, according to his, his own research, German records showed the damage done by the attack on the Moen dam the breach was 76 meters wide and 22 meters deep. A 20-ton turbine was carry, carried 100 meters downstream. 116 million cubic meters of water gushed out over 12 hours, causing a wave about 10 meters high. I think he mentioned this. Bridges and buildings were destroyed in the valley floor up to 31 miles and 41 miles away, respectively. 91 miles downstream, the Rhine rose to four meters above its normal height. Twelve factories in Neheim uh, involved in armaments, production, aircraft parts and U-boats were destroyed. Pumping stations put out of action, causing major towns like Hamm, Hagen, Bochum and Dortmund to be without drinking water. What was the flow of water uh, post-breach at the Moen? 8,800 cubic meters of water per second, slowing to 2,000 by uh, 6 o'clock, 6 a.m., uh, 1,000 by 9 a.m., and virtually a virtual halt by midday. How many civilians and military helpers were diverted from normal duties to aid the flood victims in Neheim and Vikad alone? Over 2,000. What were the official casualty figures from the Moen breach? 1,294 casualties, 476 Germans dead, 69 missing. 593 foreigners dead, 156 missing. 92 houses destroyed, 971 houses and 32 farms damaged. 11 factories destroyed, 114 factories damaged. 2,822 hectares of farmland rendered useless and a further 1,221 damaged. 6,316 farm animals killed, 25 roads and rail bridges destroyed and 21 rail bridges damaged. Oh, which is incredible. Um, I mean, the sheer devastation, but there was no way that uh, the, the Lancaster RAF Bomber Command could cause that much damage with, uh, with their raids over Germany. Uh, the German authorities reacted to this crisis caused by Operation Chastise, uh, and only 48 hours after the raid, Hitler authorised 7,000 workers to help clear up the debris, with a further 20,000 diverted from the construction work on the Atlantic Wall. Uh, Goebbels ex uh, exploited the situation by claiming the idea of the attack had been given to the RAF by a German a Jewish refugee and the notion spread by an English and a Swedish newspaper. Uh, the, uh, how quickly did the Germans repair the dam after its damage? The water supply to Dortmund was restored to 80% in just three days. Um, the uh, north coal fields were repaired by the 2nd and the 23rd of August 1943 and by the 23rd of September 1943 and the 14th of August 1943 mm. Respectively, the breaches to the Mohan and Ida dams respectively were prepared. Still, production in the Ruhr Valley was actually higher in 1943 than in previous year by a two and a half million tonnes. Uh, the countermeasures did, uh, uh, obviously we, we see there that this is how they responded so the dams wouldn't be tacked in the future. The Germans installed um, a, a limit to depth of the Mohan reservoir by 211 metres. A 36 torpedo nets, six boys, wooden deflectors, special flight defences, an aerial wire apron, 
anti-bomb and uh, rocket netting, searchlights, balloons, and smokescreen generators at Mohan. Uh, and the net cost in terms of manpower for the Germans in defending the dams was all 10,000 uh, regular troops. In addition to a reserve unit, uh, was deployed just to protect the dams, effectively denying the Germans an entire division worth of manpower. And as we come to the end of the programme, I think it's also important that we acknowledge mm. really the, the human cost in this one. Now, it's important to know that uh, Les Knight was a 22-year-old bomber who flew with the Dam Busters and uh, Wallace Barnes was 52-year-old uh, engineer and designed and developed the bouncing bomb. But both these men had something in common, uh, that they believed in uh, Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour. That must have been such a difficult uh, decision for them to make. And as you say, we, we're looking at the moral dilemma of it, but it was always the plan to bring things to an end. And, and the, war, the war machine was moving so, so fast at that time. So let me read a little bit more on this. Um, so Barnes Wallace and Les Knight would, would play such crucial roles in the mission that would result in such a catastrophic loss of life. Uh, uh, how could they do that knowing that they were committed Bible-believing Christians? Barnes Wallace himself, that's a question that we've kind of covered already. Uh, Barnes Wallace himself shed some light on this huge moral dilemma facing himself and RAF bombers uh, command when he said the greatest war crime would be to allow the war to continue any longer than is absolutely necessary. Great um, truth there. Absolutely. Les Knight was awarded the Distinguished Service Medal for his part in the dam's raid. Within weeks, he was at the controls of a 617 Lancaster for the final time during the ill-fated raid on the Dortmund Ems Canal. Over half the planes and their crews would not return. Les Knight was, one, one, uh, was among them. All four his, of his Lancaster Merlin engines having burst into flames over Holland. Uh, which is sad and also shares as well. This is, this is what his uh, wireless said at his uh, funeral. Uh, his wireless operator delivered a gut-wrenching um, message to mm. Les Knight's funeral. He said, uh, he kept that damaged aircraft flying straight and level. He said, allowing us, his crew, to parachute out and live. But in doing so, he gave his life for us. And it reminds us of the words of Jesus himself, that no mm. greater love has no one than the one who lays down his life for his friends. Mm. And I think that's a, a very good way to kind of sum up the program. Um, and particularly, it's so important that 80 years on, uh, we honor uh, RAF Bomber Command, we honor the RAF, Air, RAF air crew and pilots who threw in those um, dangerous and uh, audacious raids over Germany, particularly the Dam Busters raid, which we all know because it's legendary, made famous through the film, the Dam Busters film that came out in 1955 uh, in black and white. But it also shows really uh, the Lord's kind of protection in this one. This was a total war. And, uh, you know, we, we see there with, um, for example, uh, Barnes Wallace himself mm -hmm. wanted to bring this war to a quicker end yeah. to end the number of unnecessary casualties mm -hmm. and also then as we know uh, later on during the course of the war the Nazis were, were committing genocide on an industrial scale against okay. the Jewish people um, they wanted to turn Europe into a kind of pagan occultic empire is what's motivated by the SS mm. uh, and what we were dealing with at the time was absolutely pure evil uh, within the Nazi ideology, the Nazis' actions uh, and their regime, which they had to be brought uh, mm. to their knees in submission. And the Dam Busters raid did something to do that. Mm. I, I mean, I was just thinking it's, it's also important that we underline the fact that these guys, the age of these pilots and the crew, 22 years old. I mean, most of us don't even, we're not even mature enough and they are going out knowing that they're likely not to make it back, you know, just because of the ratio of deaths uh, on, the, on those uh, air, air raids was so high that you, you, you're likely to die. And yet they were willing to do that, uh, lay down their lives as we use that wonderful scripture, Jesus was willing to lay down his life. Uh, and they were willing to do that. And, and that wonderful story about Les, the pilot, who kept the flight going so that his crew could, could jump out with the parachutes and be safe. But, you know, these are young, young men giving up their lives. And, and you know, they, they would have seen the devastation that was caused by the bombings, and yet they knew it was worth it because they were there to save life.
I mean, what, one of the biggest regrets I've got in broadcasting is actually not to actually interview enough uh, veterans. Mm. I think I only interviewed uh, one uh, World War II uh, veteran who was uh, part of the Paras, who also fought in Israel's War of Independence. And I just wish now, because they were a special generation, and I remember being in Washington, D.C. Uh, for the opening of the Second World War Memorial, uh, to those heroes that gave their lives for the defense of Western freedoms and democracy, or as Churchill himself said, um, Christian civilization. And when they got up to speak, it was so moving, and they said, why are you honoring us? We don't need to be honored. We're mm. just doing what anyone yeah, else would have done. And this was our duty. Our, our, uh, America, the West was in peril. We had to fight. Uh, and, and that shows something about the humility of that very, very special generation, very that World nice. War II generation that we need to honour. And we can learn so much uh, about them today. Mm, that's absolutely right. And uh, it's so important to, to do what we're doing with this programme. People will be very blessed, I'm sure, by watching this. And I want to thank you all for watching tonight's program as we've marked the 80th anniversary of the famous Dam Busters raid. Now, on the 16th to the 17th of May, please use this as an opportunity to pray for our armed forces, particularly those Christians who are serving in the RAF and the Royal Navy and also in the Army. And uh, we also want to pay a special tribute to the bravery and courage shown by RAF Bomber Command, the pilots and the air crew who took part in that audacious raid over 80 years ago to give us the freedoms that we have today. So thank you for watching uh, this week's edition of uh, Behind the Headlines and uh, thank you. So shalom and God bless from us. Good night. <laughs>